Welcome to our continuing series, Fine Poetry, Poems That Touch Deeper Chords. Today, Dame Edith Louisa Sitwell, 1887 to 1964. One can find a wealth of biographical data on this poet, but we concentrate primarily on her poetry and the words of my dear friend, and elder brother, A.B. Porani. In the introduction to The Canticle of the Rose, British poet Dame Edith Sitwell wrote, quote, At the time I began to write, a change in the direction, imagery, and rhythms in poetry had become necessary. Owing to the rhythmical flaccidity, the verbal deadness, the dead and expected patterns of some of the poetry immediately preceding us." Her early work was often experimental, creating melody, using striking conceits, new rhythms, and confusing private illusions. Her efforts at change were resisted, but as the new statesman observed, quote, losing every battle, she won the campaign, end quote, and emerged the high priestess of 20th century poetry. The Times, London, stated in 1955 that, quote, she writes for the sake of sound, of color, and from an awareness of God and regard for man, end quote. This is from A.B. Purani. Edith Sitwell, in her poem, One Day in Spring, speaks of love and its eternity in face of death. She transfers death from the dead beloved to the living one and endows the dead with life of the living. When the lover, who is a living dead man, cries to his dead beloved to come home, he implores her in the following words, The cold! How shall I bear my heart without its beat, my clay without its soul? I am alone, more cold than you are in your grave's long night that has my heart for covering warmth and light. Orani continues, throughout the poem, there is a penetration into the occult worlds and an exchange between what is considered dead and the living, and yet love affirms its eternity in the following words. The waters love the moon, the sun the day, though all the lovers of the world grow old and fail and die. Yet how should you and I? For the world was only made that we should love. O heart, O eyes, O lips that will never grow cold. Purani continues, the very fact of searching behind the phenomenon of death, and the acceptance of man's self as free from the bonds of the body, the possibility of the disembodied existence as a subject of poetry has become frequent, especially under the stress of the last world war. It has opened a new realm of experience altogether to the future generations. The same author in A Song of the Cold mourns the loss of warmth in the hearts of men, which has become a world's fever. She laments, quote, the ultimate cold within the heart of man, end quote. And so a few poems from this special poet. 
Bells of Grey Crystal Bells of grey crystal break on each bow. The swan's breath will mist all the cold airs now. Like tall pagodas, two people go, trail their long codas of talk through the snow. Lonely are these, and lonely, and I. The clouds, gray Chinese geese, sleek through the sky. The web of Eros. Within your magic web of hair lies furled the fire and splendor of the ancient world. The dire gold of the comet's wind-blown hair the songs that turn to gold the evening air, when all the stars of heaven sang for joy, the flames that burnt the cloud-high city of Troy, the maned fire of spring on the cold earth, the myrrh-lit flame that gave both death and birth to the soul phoenix, and the star-bright shower that came to Denai in her brazen tower. Within your magic web of hair lies furled the fire and splendor of the ancient world. Solo for ear trumpet. The carriage brushes through the bright leaves, violent jets from life to light. Strong, polished speed is plunging, heaves between the showers of bright, hot leaves. The window glasses glaze our faces and jar them to the very basis, but they could never put a polish upon my manners or abolish my most distinct disinclination for calling on a rich relation. In her house, bulwark built between the life man lives and vision seen. The sunlight hiccups, white as chalk, grown drunk with emptiness of talk, and silence hisses like a snake, invertebrate and rattling ache. Then suddenly eternity drowns all the houses like a sea. And down the street the trump of doom blares madly, shakes the drawing room where raw edged shadows sting forlorn as dank dark nettles down the horn of her ear trumpet i convey the news that it is judgment day speak louder i don't catch my dear i roared it is the trump we hear the what the trump i shall complain the boy scouts practicing again. Answers. I kept my answers small and kept them near. Big questions bruised my mind, but still I let small answers be a bulwark to my fear. The huge abstractions I kept from the light. Small things I handled and caressed and loved. I let the stars assume the whole of night. But the big answers clamored to be moved into my life. Their great audacity shouted to be acknowledged and believed. Even when all small answers build up to protection of my spirit, Still I hear big answers striving for their overthrow and all the great conclusions coming near. And the last very brief poem, Poetry, ennobles the heart and the eyes and unveils the meaning of all things upon which the heart and the eyes dwell. 
It discovers the secret rays of the universe and restores to us forgotten paradises. <laughs>